We welcome you all to the south end zone of Kyle Field inside Studio 12. It is time for another Yell and Review with our Director of Athletics, Ross Bjork. It's late September and we couldn't get out of this month without bringing <laughs> Ross on to answer the questions provided by the 12th man. As always, if you have a question for Ross, you can ask it at the official website of Texas A&M Athletics. Go to 12thman.com slash ask Ross. So I'm Will Johnson with Andrew Monaco. Ross is here before any line of questioning. My first one is, has everybody caught their breath from Saturday night in Arlington? <laughs> We're not going to be able to discuss anything unless we can breathe again. <laughs> After all of our hearts stopped with a field goal that hit off the top of the upright yeah. late Saturday night, Arlington, Texas. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, it's hard to believe. You know, you wait all summer and you're anticipating, God, can we can we play football already? And now we've already played four games. And you're mm -hmm. like, hey, can we slow down a little bit? Exactly. <laughs> and Saturday's October 1st. Um, so I, I think everybody will probably remember, like, where they were standing or, like, were they actually looking at the kick or are they not trying to look or, you know, all those kind of things. Normally, like, I don't look at those things. Like, if we're kicking it or someone else, like, I try to, like, look away and either try to jinx the other team <laughs> or something like that. And for this one, I was actually standing next to Ethan Fisher. Mm. Coach Fisher's son, youngest son, and I said, Ethan, something good is going to happen for us. Like, we're, we're due this moment, whether it's a block, something. I said, something's good is good, you know, good is going to happen. And so I was watching the whole thing, and it was like it was frozen in time, mm. right? And I, I think you were on that end, too. Yeah. I think you were standing oh. on that end. You were obviously up in the booth. Mm -hmm. and that, when that thing hit, it was like dead silence yeah. in the stadium. You could, like, hear it. Goalpost was shaking, and then I really couldn't tell like where it was going to fall. Right? Was it going to fall and hit the crossbar and go in? Mm -hmm. Then it would have counted. But when that sucker hit the ground, place just went crazy. Mm -hmm. I've never Obviously seen Isaiah Rakes I mean, jump higher. It was unbelievable. Yeah, so, and rightfully so. Yeah, it was fun. To Ross's point, though, if you're if you're on our sidelines and you're looking up at a kick, you're looking into the lights. Right. At AT and T Stadium, I saw the post wobble. And then for the first time in my life at a football game, I yeah. said, why is there no football? Yeah. Never yeah. saw a football. Right, right. Really? It, it went and up it into the lights. Up, you're you know. totally blinded yeah. from it. And like, right. why, why does the football no longer yeah. exist? I thought <laughs> when, uh, when he kicked it, I thought it was going to go – I thought it was shifting right. That's it what looked, Jimbo said. It looked like yeah. it was – like you could tell from the sideline, like, okay, that thing's going right. But no idea it would – obviously hit the top of the – It seemed to have a different post. trajectory. Like it stayed in the air. Like you know how some kicks – yeah. Almost. Yeah, it stayed it in the air, yeah. and then when it hit it, and I'm like you, as soon as it hit it, I'm like, that's the good news. Where is it going? Right. Which direction yeah, is, is it going to, to ricochet? <laughs> Where's it going to land? And so, but hey, give, give our team credit. I mean, being down 14 nothing, and to rally back uh, right before halftime. How about that fumble and return? Just get that fumble recovery. And then, mm -hmm. you know, we held them to, you know, seven points yeah. the rest of the game mm -hmm. after going down 14 0. So give our guys a lot of credit and a lot of poise and maturity and growing up in that game. and Hopefully that gives us a spark to, to finish these last eight games strong. Yeah. So a lot, a lot of fun. 23-21 mm -hmm. Aggies. On the winning yeah. side of that That's one. right. <laughs> Let's get back on the winning side <laughs> yeah. after uh, the previous nine in a row got snapped last year. But 23-21, to 21, the Aggies over Arkansas. Now we're headed to Starkville, uh, and it gets no easier. I mean, if you think yeah. it, things were hanging in the balance on Saturday, look, it's the SEC, and Jimbo Fisher said it. Get ready for things like that every Saturday. Maybe not the wildness mm -hmm. of, a, of a ball off the goalpost, but we're going to be in tight games. Yeah. That's just yeah. this yeah. league. No no doubt. Life in the SEC, <laughs> right? It's uh, it's not for the faint of heart, no. as we like to say, but that's every sport. I mean, you think about uh, what, what our soccer team is going through right now and off to a tough start, but battling in, in every game and lose 3-2 to two and then have a road game at a top-10 program. I mean, every match, every game, no matter what the competition, our golf team is in the SEC match play. Mm -hmm. Right now we're battling uh, Auburn, you know, volleyball wins on Saturday against Tennessee, but then, you know, loses on Sunday. I mean, so it's the SEC. So if you can, uh, if you can go through this gauntlet, you're, you're prepared mm -hmm. for postseason. And so uh, hopefully uh, things continue to go well and get our, get our fall sports going mm -hmm. at a high level. All right. So, yeah, Saturday <coughs> Aggie football is in Starkville to take on Mississippi State. Like Ross said, plenty of fall sports in action, soccer, volleyball, cross country. 
even the non-championship seasons, uh, Trisha Ford has fall ball going with her first right. softball mm-hmm. team. Jim Schlossnagel, same thing with the baseball team as they're off of Omaha run. To say it's busy basketball, is quite yeah. an Basketball's yeah. doing the buzzes. Got boot camp, boot camp. Mm-hmm. going yeah. on right now. Mm-hmm. Joni Taylor is coming back from Australia, being with uh, Team USA. So, I mean, look, it's October 1st this weekend, and before long we're going to be playing <laughs> exhibition basketball games. Yeah. I mean, equestrian yeah. started last week. I mean, swimming and diving starts up a uh, week after uh, this weekend. They start up. I mean, so it's on. It's uh, it's full go. Mm-hmm. So this is the yell and review, the second edition right. of mm-hmm. yell and review mm-hmm. to make sure that that's fully <laughs> branded out there and mm-hmm. it's a new format and mm-hmm. we've got our creative folks here in the background monitoring every word that we say. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure uh, Yeti is uh, fully exposed <laughs> yeah. here as our sponsor. But yell and review. I think so far, I think it's gone really well. Yeah. I think people like the sort of the new branding and the new capturing of not only uh, this production of doing the, the Q&A on video, but also the, the written form that will go out uh, later this week as well. So just trying to be creative and uh, stay cutting edge with, with yell and review. Back to being as transparent as you can, right? Even for, for the 12th man, if they, don't, if they can't get through your door, it's not like, well, I didn't right. know that was happening. Right. I didn't know that was it. There's no some doubt. things that they'll never know, right? But right. you try to be as upfront as you, possible. You can't communicate enough. You know, communicate, communicate, communicate. And so this is another platform to, to do that. I know we have, you know, coaches shows and we have lots of broadcasts and things like that. And But I think hearing from administrators, hearing from – you know, leadership, I, I think, is important. And so yell and review mm-hmm. captures the, the A&M sort of tradition of uh, what yelling means and obviously what review mm-hmm. from a core perspective means. So this is a, a good uh, platform to do it. So second edition. Yep. Twelfth man, you yell it out. We'll review it with <laughs> Ross <That's right. laughs> when he gets here. And uh, let's, let's get to the line of questioning. And I have a question about our first uh, submittal. It's from Garrett, uh, who's from Cincinnati. He says he's Aggie class yeah. of 22 and a half. Yeah, wait, wait a second. What do we get? I can there? explain this. No, okay. I can explain okay. this because my son is fighting Texas Aggie class of 2018. And a half. And a half. Yeah, December okay. graduate. December graduate. Yeah. So after One the, more when semester. you graduate after the fall, you're giving yourself We're going with the half. half. Yeah. There. Yeah. Okay. So, so he said, and he said to me, oh, Dad, I love falls in College Station. How could I argue? I'm right. yeah, I'm buying yeah, you the keep, sports pass. Yeah. Don't worry. Keep going another <laughs> another semester. That's right. So Garrett must still be here. Yeah. Or he's finishing up online or something, mm-hmm. and he's graduating in December. Should be his last semester. Then. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. 22. Yep. What does that make me, a summer graduate, a class of 01.75? <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah. What, or wait wait a second. That's you doing math. Hold on a second. <laughs> 1.75 was my GPA for a while. <laughs> <laughs> So Garrett actually has a couple of questions, and it uh, centers around football scheduling. One of them does, but he wants to go back for for one of his questions. If everybody remembers 2020 when the Aggies went nine and one, won the Orange Bowl, champions there, but it was the COVID season, so scheduling was difficult. Things were getting postponed. Things were popping onto the schedule. Things go off the schedule. Uh, Garrett asks his first question, and he wants to know. Was there ever actually talks in 2020 about Ohio State coming to play at Kyle Field at the end of the season? As we know, A&M and Ohio State both were prime candidates to be in the playoff that year. No, there wasn't actually any any formal talks. I think that was a, a, a Twitter sphere uh, conversation more than anything. I, and I believe, if I remember the, the sequencing of all of that, I think it was around the Ole Miss game. Mm-hmm when that game uh, wasn't able to be played. And then uh, we had, let's see, I think it was coming off of uh, South. We went on a road trip to South Carolina, came back. We had some positive cases. We couldn't play the next week. How do you move games around? We ended up going to Tennessee later than we originally were scheduled. So I think it was around some of that that movement uh, late in 2020. But there was never any formal talks. I think that was all just some Twitter uh, Twitter talk and Twitter fun. Mm-hmm. Because the, the the Big Ten said no. Yes, we're going to play. Would they end up playing six games? Right, six games, yeah. right. Can you fit Ohio State in? Were, were right. they willing to play more? What was that going to do to the playoff conversation? Mm-hmm. Those kind of things. No. So, no, but there was no, nothing ever uh, formal at that time. Okay, and now he looks to the future. After yeah. Garrett looks back, he looks to the future. He's from up there in Cincinnati, so maybe he has some right. special interest right. in this. Uh when will we ever see a home and home against either Michigan 
or Ohio's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we we would love to play uh, Big Ten opponents, and we've actually tried. We've we've called uh, numerous uh, programs to see if if there's interest in a home and home. Has to be a straight up home and home. We're not the neutral site games. We're not really interested in that. We want those games on campus, and we haven't had any luck. Uh, we're willing to do it, and I think uh, part of that is them coming down and playing in the Texas heat mm-hmm. in the September, because typically you, those games are going to be played in September. Um, we just haven't had any uh, willing participants on the on the Big Ten side. So, whether it's Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, Wisconsin, you know, we want to play places that have large stadiums like we have here at Kyle Field. And so, we just haven't had any luck. So, when the question is, when will we ever see? Don't know. Mm-hmm. We'll keep trying. We're uh, we're scheduled out with our Power Five opponent. Through 2029, Louisville, mm-hmm. 28-29 is our last scheduled Power Five, and we're working on what happens in 2030 and beyond. And so, just nothing has come together. Uh, we'll keep trying and keep uh, pounding the pavement to to see what happens on the non-conference schedule. Will some things change or change the way reach out more when the new schedule yeah. comes out in the yeah, SEC? Yeah, so that's a, that's a component, and so we have to decide: Are we going to stay at eight SEC games? which is what we have now, mm-hmm. or do we go to nine games? And so that decision, I hope, is made sometime this fall where we can make that decision. And if we, go to, if we stay at eight games, it'll be a 1-7 model. Mm-hmm. One permanent opponent, seven rotational opponents. Then you could maintain kind of your current non-conference philosophy. One power five opponent and three sort of guarantee games is what we call those. If you go to nine games, you'll have three – permanent opponents and six rotational opponents then you have to decide do you still want to play a power five game i think we should play a power five game in addition if we do go to nine sec games that that'd be our desire Mm -hmm. and then you figure out who do you want to play locally Um, we like the fcs game fcs game Um, i think that gives back to to the game of football and then you'd have one other game if you're playing that power five game so then it comes down to the rotation Mm mm-hmm so if you're playing nine conference games, you're going to have five home games one year and four road games. Mm-hmm. The next year, four home games, five road games within the SEC. So then you want to make sure that you're always playing seven home games. Mm-hmm. And so figuring out that rotation is going to be tricky. So the first layer to that decision is let's make a decision on either eight or nine games then we could decide how do we maneuver non-conference. So hopefully later this fall we'll have some clarity. If this team stays on its trajectory, right, and becomes mm-hmm. one of those Final Four CFP, then the Aggies become one of those teams that might play on Labor Day. Does that change, you know, one of yeah. those kickoff classic type things? Could It could. Again, we're not opposed to neutral site per mm-hmm. se, but I think the way it's going now with these big, these big marquee games, playing them on campus – that's why we want the Arkansas game to be played right. on campus, mm-hmm. right? Um, those are big games. And to have your community involved in that, have the home crowd. Now, we have to play on the road, mm-hmm. right? We get that too, mm-hmm. but those are fun. Those are, you know, the, and the atmosphere was, was good at Jerry, Jerry's World, it was. Know, AT&T Stadium. Um, I guess people call it Jerry, Jerry yeah, World, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it was fun on Saturday, but it wasn't full. It wasn't sold out, right? right? And if that game's on campus, whether it's in Fayetteville or Kyle Field, that game's full. Yeah. Um, and so we want games that are full. Um, and then going back to the CFP, we're kind of prolonging this question. When we go to 12 playoff teams, mm-hmm. when that expands, if the ability to host games on campus happens, and we think it will, mm-hmm. so if you're ranked five through eight, you would host a playoff game. Mm-hmm. That's going to be an epic moment. Right. Whatever campus gets to host those games. Now, you want to be ranked in the top four. Mm-hmm. But, man, hosting a playoff game and the impact on your community and your campus and your, your donations and your suites and your sponsors and all those things that layer into that, that's going to be a monumental moment. So we'll see how it all you know, gets sorted out. But there's some exciting opportunities as all these things change. CFP, SEC scheduling, non-conference scheduling. We'd love to play Big Ten opponents. And so uh, we're, we're going to keep trying. All right, Garrett, thank you for that question. And uh, – Good luck finishing off, I guess, right. if you're class of 22, 22 and a half. 25. <laughs> uh, let's move it over to basketball. Uh, a couple questions here. One came in late that we want to get to, but the first one came from Dan Collins, who's Aggie class of 90. 
Uh, Ross, we've spent north of half a billion on football, uh, upgrading Olsen and Bluebell Park as well, and softball and track with another plan, he mm-hmm. says, with track. Uh, he gets a little blunt here, and he says, how much longer <laughs> are you going to ignore basketball? Right, right. <laughs> hey, Dan, Dan's laying it out there, Cla- <laughs> class of 90. Um, <laughs> You know, as far as I think what he's referring to is is Reed Arena, um, uh, you know, where we play our games. Um, but as far as as far as our attention to basketball, and this started before I got here, but in the fall of 2017, we installed a new video board at, at Reed Arena, which enhanced, you know, the fan experience. The Cox McFerrin building, which is our day-to-day building for basketball, locker rooms, offices, practice gyms, training room, player lounge, weight room, We've spent about $8 million on that building since 2018. New men's locker room, mm-hmm. new women's locker room, new men's offices. We're actually, now that we have a new coach, we're getting ready to renovate the office complex on the women's basketball side. We've upgraded both gymnasiums with new LED lighting mm-hmm. so we can just hit a button versus waiting the 20 minutes for lights to <laughs> warm up and kind of the old school way of doing that. We've uh, expanded and renovated our training room We've renovated both lob. There's a lobby on the arena floor that we've upgraded and renovated, and there's a lobby on the main concourse mm-hmm. level. We've upgraded both of those. So we've spent about eight million dollars um, since 2000. Actually, about ten million if, when you add the video board in since 2017. The arena itself is not as straightforward. That's not just a linear project. That is a university project. Mm-hmm. It's really more of a campus partnership type project. And until we figure out where would the money come from, exactly what can be built, we've got a lot of plans and a lot of designs that are, that are concepts. So we're not ignoring it. It just comes down to what's the timing of it and then how do we pay for it. And so those elements have to come together uh, before we say, here's what we're going to do. We know it's a priority. We know it's a project that we, we want to tackle at some point in time. It's just it's got to be layered in with all these other things and – we're going to get to it eventually. And we still, again, I've said it many times on this show, on uh, our town hall before it was called Yell and Review, on any other appearance when people ask me about Reed Arena, we still have to answer the question. Do you build a new one mm-hmm. or do you actually renovate? Right. And to me, those, those answers are still out there in terms of what's the right approach. And uh, we have to study that. We're continuing to, to analyze what is the right approach. The advantage of Reed Arena is it is next to Cox McFerrin mm-hmm. Center. If you build a new arena, where would you put it? You don't want to vacate Cox McFerrin Center because it's a great building, and we've actually just spent a lot of money on it. So where do you put a new arena? How does it tie in to, to a renovation of Reed? All those, all those things have to be on the table. So we're not ignoring it, uh, Dan, <laughs> by any means. Uh, basketball absolutely is a priority here. Uh, we know we can compete at a high level in both men's and women's, and uh, we've, I think we've shown the commitment, coaching staff, Facility-wise, fan experience, we're, we've done more things to make the experience in Reed Arena better. Um, and so the building itself needs to come, and uh, eventually it will. I had another basketball question come in just before we started, actually. Uh, and it deals with the SEC Big 12 Challenge that takes mm-hmm. place annually in January in men's basketball. And the question centered around uh, why aren't the Aggies – in that challenge this coming January of 2023. Yeah. We wanted to get to that one quickly before yeah. we moved on from right. basketball. Right. So in the Big 12, they've only got 10 teams. In the current format of the Big 12, we have 14, and so four are, are left out. And so um, it, it's all based on a two-year rotation. So this is the second year of the current two-year rotation. And so the 2021 season is what it was built off of. And unfortunately, that, that year did not go well for us. And so we're, we're in this cycle where we're in this two-year rotation where we're not in the Big 12 challenge. Based off last year's record of 9-9, nine and nine, hopefully it's a good season this year. Mm-hmm. We expect to be back in the – but it may not be the Big 12 challenge, right? right. I mean, who knows what's going to happen. Right. They're obviously expanding. We've got Texas and Oklahoma coming in. So there's discussions about does that continue? Does that series even continue? Uh, but we, we would anticipate if it does in the Big 12, uh, I guess in the fall of 23, the Big 12, do we know how many teams there will be? Will it be in 12 23 or 14? Or coming. 
Are they going to spend life with 16 for they a might little be, while? They might, be, uh, <laughs> they might be 14 in the fall of 23, 23, 24. <laughs> Yeah, 14, so we'd be at 14, and so maybe it's a yeah. matchup where, it, hey, it's a two-year sort of bridge before Texas and Oklahoma. Right. So who knows what might happen. But that, that's a good question. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. threw that in there at the last minute. That yeah. came across yeah. a late our, submittal, but we'll Twitter get to it. Feed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, now we got to get to Sutton. Okay. Two lengthy ones, as usual. Is this usual. the best for last? Well, the longest yeah. for last. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the most tenured. Yeah. For last, <laughs> Sutton yep. Turner, class of 93, from College Station. First question is this, Ross. In August, nearly 37,000 student passes were purchased, which is 1,000 more than last year. However, last year, many programs like Alabama were complaining about students not showing up or leaving early from games. These programs even introduced an app to give students loyalty mm-hmm, points mm-hmm. to stay at the games. So, Ross... What are you, Kristen, and the athletic department doing to not lose the advantage we enjoy of the 12th man at Kyle Field? Yeah. He had a second question, but maybe we ought to unpack that yeah. first. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's a, it's an ongoing discussion, and, and obviously we're very fortunate here at Texas A&M. We have, they just announced the enrollment numbers. We have almost 75,000 students. Mm-hmm. Now, they're not all here in College Station. I think it's about 69,000 here in College Station. So if we sold – 37 all sports passes basically half of our student body bought an all sports pass and more than half that are in college station Mm -hmm. bought an all sports pass so we're very very fortunate that there's a built-in loyalty among our uh, students the the 12th man but you can't ignore that right you've got to make sure you engage with them i think one of the unique things that we have is that we have ticket pull versus it's real convenient to have a ticket on your phone and you download it, and then it's like, eh, am I gonna? Uh, I'm not gonna go today. But if they have that physical ticket in their hand, we think that gives us a, a huge advantage. So we want to make sure that we continue that piece of it. We did introduce 12th Man Rewards. It's an app-based program where you come to any athletic event and you register, then you get you get points and you accumulate points for prizes. And so that's that's picking up uh, more and more traffic as we go along here. So that's that's one program that we, again, not can't take anything uh, for granted. Let's make sure we stay cutting edge. So 12th Man Rewards app. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, he asked about uh, are we involved in new student conference, fish camp, tea yeah. camp. We have tons of exposure at all those. And really it's we expose the all sports pass. And mm-hmm. we make – so you go through the spring and people start buying all sports passes and it sort of levels off. But come summer when all these conferences pick up, and fish camp picks up, I mean, our numbers spike um, through the roof. I mean, it's really phenomenal to see from, like, middle of July to the end of August. I mean, we basically double our our number. Um, And so it's really fast. So the impact of having exposure at all of those different orientations, fish camp, new student conferences, what he references as well, we're there. We We have presence. Our marketing folks are out there constantly sending out messages, being being present. Um, and so our student athletes, people always ask about our student athletes going to fish camp. It's really not practical based on practice and reporting. Uh, but we have what's called traditions night within our student athlete population. We want to make sure that they have access to all the traditions and they understand what Texas A&M is all about. Different, different question, but it layers into the tradition, right? It's all about mm-hmm. how do we protect and em- embrace the tradition. How do we grow upon that? How do we not lose what makes A&M special? And that is you're there at the game, you're standing up the entire game, and you're a part of it. You make an impact. Um, no matter what the score is, I mean, look, we were losing against App State. People were there. They were there. Because they thought, hey, I can impact the game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what? It didn't work out. We didn't win the game, but they stayed. And so we've got to make sure that we – keep embracing that and uh there's technology pieces there's the loyalty pieces there's the face-to-face there's the ticket pool there's the physical ticket there's lots of layers here i think make make it special and and we'll continue to to grow upon that the beauty is the uh, student athletes i know in basketball they're doing the yells at midnight yell but they're also with the yell leaders and read rowdies after games and on the buses or the planes 
there's a designated yeah. yell leader, and the same thing happened with uh, with baseball. Yeah. The same thing. Right. There's there's That's that right. involvement. That's so right. it does That's bounce right. off on them, and yep. and they they revel. And there's in a it. there's a constant effort, and I'm probably missing 500 other things that we do that are just little touch points. But there's a there's a constant effort. Um, among lots of folks in athletics to make sure we, we make those contacts. Mm-hmm. One more question to go uh, before we get to it. One, one of the mm-hmm. prizes of that 12th Man Rewards program is uh, lunch with Ross, Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Is oh, that in the R.C. Right. Slocum Nutrition Center, or do you pick the place? I don't know. We'll does the Aggie Prize winner get to pick the know. place? <laughs> so. Hey. That's yeah. a good – maybe we'll, we'll have to it's figure that out. And who's it all? Uh, that's a really good <laughs> prize. <laughs> I mean, it may depend. We need people to boost that up. So maybe we can pack the Slocum Center. With lunch, that there would be go. cool. Yeah, we that don't want, would be we don't very want cool. that to be a small lunch. So no, 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 no. Yeah. no. Let's it's get ten, a crowd. Ten games. Let's get a crowd. Absolutely. And, and I was wrong. Sutton, I guess, technically had three questions today. He did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we got. We've oh, got yeah, one more. He layered to go. In yeah. The, yeah, yeah, he layered in the. Uh, he had one we, question, yeah. two parts, yeah. and then late, at a later date, he just sent in a whole yeah. other yeah. question. So he describes the Longhorns as Texas University, or TU, okay. as, as some Aggies do. But uh, Texas has a policy for home games that places the visiting team's band on the third deck. For the recent Alabama-Texas game, Bama did not bring their band based on the Texas policy. As SEC athletic directors, will this policy be forced to change, or will this policy be allowed to continue and hurt any game day <laughs> atmospheres and student band members? So I believe he's talking specifically about when visiting teams go to SEC venues. Right. That's what he's talking about. That's what about, I right? took it as. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the policy in the SEC is that you have to supply – it's really amount around tickets. So for the visiting team, we have to supply 2,000 tickets in the lower seating bowl unless the visiting team says, hey, we only need 1,000. Mm-hmm. But at a minimum, there has to be 2,000 in the lower seating bowl. And then if the visiting team says, hey, we'd like another 3,000 tickets, can you accommodate that? And the answer is yes, then you can put those anywhere you want. But on the front end, there has to be 2,000 tickets assigned to the visiting team in the lower seating bowl. So here at Kyle Field, right, we've got the southeast corner. Everyone's familiar with that. We supply 2,000 in that lower seating bowl. That's, that's the SEC policy. And then – the visiting team decides where do you put your band? Mm. Do you put them in those lower tickets? If that's where you want to put them. Typically when SEC mm. teams come here, they're always in the lower the only place bowl. I've seen them, yeah. So there's not, a, there's not a specific policy on where do you put the visiting team band. That's up to the visiting team ticket directors and the administration to decide, hey, we're going to put them down here. I've never seen a band – up top here at Kyle Field. I've never really seen that in the in the SEC. When I was at my previous institution at Ole Miss, it was one single seating bowl. So you could put them mm. technically at the top, mm-hmm. but they were still in the lower seating mm-hmm. bowl because there was only one single deck. Um, so we haven't discussed it yet. I would imagine Texas will have to uh, adapt their, their policy. Um, if that's their policy to stick them up there um, and they force that, then to me, we have to decide among those 2,000 tickets, do you put the band down there or not? We'd want to put our band down there, but that also takes away from you know the fan experience piece as well. So I think it'll be a conversation. We'll see how it shakes out. But I think sticking a, a band up top, I don't think that's, uh, that's anything we would want to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also know that there's demand for those lower tickets. So um, it's a good question. It seemed to have popped up um, <laughs> after that game yeah. mm-hmm. uh, for whatever reason and uh, something that we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to discuss as we move forward. Yeah. And as we're on this long road stretch with football, not back here at Kyle till mm-hmm. October 29th, uh, it's always nice to have that Aggie band in a it row. Is, venue. No doubt. It's, sometimes they march, sometimes they don't. Right. Right. Just the sounds of Aggie land being in a right. road venue I think help all of us, right. that's exactly whether they right. march at halftime mm-hmm. or yep. not. <laughs> yep. But that's uh, that's that's how the current policies work, and mm-hmm. something that if that if that's going to be something that they you know dictate, where hey, you've got to put your band up there, I don't think you'll see that many bands no. traveling mm-hmm. like Alabama chose chose not to. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So good point. Absolutely. Okay. All right. That's it for All September. Right. That was good. <laughs> All right. Good questions. <laughs> October's coming soon enough. Right around the corner. Yeah. Saturday. <laughs> yeah. October's Saturday. here on Saturday. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> And then again, October 29th, next football game here. 
So yeah. it's wild. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Who who made that schedule? <laughs> I guess you can blame blame the AD <laughs> on that one. I guess. Um, but Pro- no, it's there's uh, probably a question coming in. It, now. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. But it's actually uh, real quick. It's actually a ripple effect of having the game in AT and T Stadium because mm-hmm. that game is a designated date. Mm-hmm. It's not like that game can move around every year. It's got it. So then. What that does is bec- that becomes an anchor on what else can happen around it. Mm-hmm. So the ripple effect was we got three straight road games with a bye week, mm-hmm. and we don't play a home game until the 29th. And yeah. so, again, back to why that game needs to get back to campus. Here's another example is when that date is predetermined so far out and everything else has to get set around it, it doesn't allow any flexibility. So that's where we got stuck yeah. with All right. at Mississippi State, at Alabama, and – by week and then at South Carolina. <laughs> there we go. Yep. All right. Enjoyed it as always, okay. guys. And Thanks, appreciate guys. your time. Thanks, Ross. All right. Thank Dig you, Max. Thank all you. All. Right. Thanks to our producer, Matt Simon, our engineer, Johnny Kerr, and our director, Chris Brogdon. That is another yelling review from the south end zone of Kyle Field with our director of athletics, Ross Bjork. We will see you in October. So long, everybody.